Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. In this video, it's going to be just a review of polar equations, polar coordinates, and just the polar coordinate system for a Calc 2 student, or in other words, an integral calculus student. You need this information just because you're going to be finding areas underneath um, or within polar curves and arc lengths of polar curves. And so you do have to have this this information. It's expected because it's prerequisite material, but we often find that students come into a Calc 2 class and it's been two years or, or two semesters, I should say, since they've seen polars. And sometimes their introduction to polars is just uh, a single day within uh, their pre-calculus course. So uh, in light of that, I'd like to go ahead and take this time to go ahead and review right? So what is um, the polar coordinate system and, and what are polar coordinates? Well, let's go ahead and take a moment to uh, briefly uh, take a look at them using technology first, just the coordinate system itself. So what I'm going to be using here is Desmos. And in Desmos, um, we can go ahead and turn on Normally you don't have it like this. Normally you have it in, in this grid format, but we're gonna go ahead and keep it in the polar coordinate system, right? Polar coordinate system is a coordinate system where uh, you can get to any point like you can on the plane via the Cartesian, but in the polar coordinates, you're going to reference every place in the world via uh, angles and distances. So for example, you see this pi over six here, to get to that point that's on this concentric circle here, I am going to go th rotate through an angle of pi over six, and then I'm gonna step forward one, two, three, four, five, six units, because you can see this circle here that it's on is a radius of six. So every point on the polar coordinate system has a representation that includes both its angle and a distance from the center. Let's go ahead and define that stuff. Well, now that we have a visual of the cart or not Cartesian, but the polar coordinate system, I'm going to do my by hand version of the polar coordinate system. Now, this right here is no longer going to be called the x axis. That would be called the x axis in the Cartesian coordinate system because we're based on the x y axis. But the polar coordinate system, as I mentioned, is not based on the x y axis. Instead, it's based on kind of circles. And, the, and a pole. And so this right here is called the polar axis. And the center is called the pole. And actually, you don't really need, honestly, a vertical line here. Uh, technically speaking, the entire polar coordinate system is just the polar axis and the pole. Um, and then we use the vertical lines uh, the vertical line, that is, and the opposite uh, horizontal line as kind of guidelines to help us graph. But again, every point in space on this screen has a representation as a polar coordinate. So for example, this point right here, let's just pretend an XY coordinate system that is some point that is 45 degrees up. Well, then it could be 1-1 one, one or 2-2 two, two or something like that, but it's 45 degrees or remember as your instructor, your calculus instructor should tell you, um, everything in our world, in uh, calculus world, works only in terms of radians. So we're going to go ahead and call that angle pi over 4, just for argument's sake here. Okay, So we have an angle of pi over 4 and then we walk out a certain distance whatever this distance is, we'll call it R. So every point in space has coordinates R and its angle, in this case, pi over four. Um, in general, a point in space would have R theta as its coordinates. And that's, by the way, why I have R theta right here. So uh, think of it in alphabetical order because theta is T-H-E-T-A. And uh, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Although, to be very honest with you, when I graph in polar coordinate systems, or in the polar coordinate system, uh, I end up thinking angles first and then radius. So let's go ahead 
and uh, just throw out a few points here just to kind of get used to this. So for example, if I wanted to uh, graph uh, the polar point, um, let's just make it easy, one comma um, pi over three. Remember, it is in the order of R theta. That means, now here's how I think about it, that you always face the polar axis first. The polar axis, again, is actually the only axis that exists. Let me just kind of highlight that with a thicker pen here. So this is actually the only axis that exists in the polar coordinate system. And so what we're going to do is start facing that direction. Let me get back to my pen. And I'm going to turn through an angle of pi over 3. So I'm facing the polar axis and I turn through an angle of pi over 3. And once I've turned through that angle of pi over 3, standing at the pole, I'm going to step forward a unit. Let's just say that this is a distance of one. So that point would be one comma pi over three. Oops, comma pi over three. I was thinking something and so I immediately started writing it. Of course, you could also, let me go ahead and erase this down here. You can also have um, co uh, coordinates or uh, points that are in other axes or in their, sorry, other quadrants. So let's pretend as though we have um, maybe two comma um, seven pi over six. Well, seven pi over six is beyond pi. I'm gonna use a different color for this. I'll use red. So you're gonna rotate out beyond pi, an extra little pi over six, and you're gonna step out two units. So let's pretend that's about here. Okay, so that point would be two comma seven pi over six. And we might as well just reveal a theorem uh, that we're gonna run into in a moment. Suppose that we had somebody came in and said, listen, I don't want you to graph those two points. Instead, I want you to graph the point negative one comma four pi over three. Let's go ahead, I'm, this red ink is gonna get in my way, so let me erase it. And I'm gonna rotate through an angle of four pi over three. Well, three pi over three gets me to all the way 180 degrees. An extra pi over three gets me to this angle right here. So I've rotated all the way around to there. Now I'm gonna start, stand at the pole and I'm gonna step backwards, actually. So I am technically facing this direction. However, I need to step backwards. That, that's what that negative one means. I'm gonna step backwards one unit. So let me go ahead and do that. I'll step backwards here, one unit, and guess where I land? Right there. So this polar coordinate is the same thing as negative one comma four pi over three. And this brings forward a theorem in um, mathematics that there are infinite, there are an infinite number of representations for a point in the polar coordinate system. Whereas in the Cartesian coordinate system, there's only one representation. You go um, over three units and up four. There's only one way to say that, over three and up four. Where, uh, but in the polar coordinate system, you have an infinite number of representations. And in fact, you can create as many as you want here, right? So I could say, um, no, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna rotate through two pi plus an extra pi over three. So what is that, seven pi over three? And then I'll step out one unit. So that's rotating through two pi and then an additional pi over three. So now you're just standing at the pole but facing this direction and you step out one unit and there you go, you're back at that point. So let's go ahead and take a look at the theorem that I'm kind of stating here. It is actually the second theorem down below, right here, that there are infinitely many representations of a point in the polar coordinate system. And it's very, very easy to prove because all you need to do is if I give you a point R theta, well, it's the same thing as R comma theta plus two pi K. There you go. You have an infinite number of representations and you're done. The other theorem that we're looking at is how we're going to change between the Cartesian coordinate system and the polar coordinate system and vice versa. And so this is gonna be reminiscent of a theorem that you learned way back in trigonometry. There was a definition for trig functions, specifically um, you should have had what's called 
what I usually call the point definition for a trig function, which is that cosine of theta is x over r, and sine of theta is y over r, where r is the radius of the circle that you're plotting the point on. And if that's the case, that will imply that x is equal to r cosine of theta, and y is equal to r sine of theta. That's just from trigonometry. And so that's where these two points uh, come up. So let me highlight those. That's where this guy comes up and this guy comes up. Again, if that is the angle between the positive x-axis and the line connecting the origin to the point. So let me go ahead and draw that. So the statement is that we have some point in space, x comma y. And again, this is because we're dealing with the x-y axis right now. Okay. But we know that the angle made with the positive x-axis is going to be theta. Now, I'm drawing this in quadrant one, but the argument works whether you're in quadrants two, three, or four. And what we could do is we could draw an artificial altitude here. So let me go ahead and do that. Doop, 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 right? And I easily can see that the distance along the horizontal is the x value, and the distance along the vertical is the y value. And I can relate theta to that, um, those point, those values x and y, as long as I know the length of the hypotenuse, which I'll call r for right now. And thus, we get the following, right? That sine of theta, I always start with a sine for some reason, opposite over hypotenuse, y over r, which implies y is equal to r sine of theta. And cos of theta, again, is x over r. Or in other words, x is equal to r cos of theta. And to find out what r is, well, that's just using Pythagorean theorem. And r is a positive length. Although, technically speaking, it doesn't need to be. Um, we could use just the true Pythagorean theorem without the square root. So r squared is x squared plus y squared. However, usually when you're doing the mathematics here, you're going to assume, just to make your life easier, that you'll use the positive value for r. So um, we're going to go ahead and say this implies r is equal to the positive square root. It doesn't need to be, but, but we are going to force it to be in all our circumstances. So r is equal to the positive square root of x squared plus y squared. And so you can see this actually does match most of the theorem, the first theorem. There is a little bit at the end here. And that little bit at the end is a relationship between theta, x, and y. So let me scroll down here. Notice I can, via trigonometry, develop the relationship between theta, x, and y. The way I could do that is using a tangent. So I'll say tangent of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent y over x. Now, honestly, you're not going to use this uh, this relationship this way. In, instead, you're, you're going to say that theta is equal to the tan inverse of y over x. But that's actually wrong uh, in not all cases, but it's not always correct. How's that? So what I'm going to say here is that the reference angle, so remember the reference angle is the um, angle less than 90 degrees or less than pi over two. Um, it's the fastest angle to the x-axis, whether it's the positive or the negative x-axis. So what we're going to do is say that tan inverse is going to return to us a reference angle. Now, if you didn't take trigonometry with me and you took trig with somebody else and they didn't teach you this, then I'm going to teach you a kind of an easy way to do this. You should have had a trig course. So this, um, what I'm saying about reference angles here shouldn't surprise you, but I just want to remind you, tan inverse only returns angles between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And the reality is, I do not, when I'm talking reference angles, I want positive reference angles. I do not want negative reference angles. So what I'm going to do is restrict it to be just the positives. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to make my reference angle theta which I, that's theta hat is very common to use as the reference angle notation. I'm going to use that 
with tan inverse of the absolute value of y over x. Now think about this. The absolute value of something is always positive, and so I, or at least always non-negative. And the tan inverse of something that's non-negative is either zero or it's in the first quadrant. So this reference angle is between zero and pi over two. It can't be pi over two ex exactly because um, that is uh, not in the domain of the tangent, but this will return an angle, a reference angle between zero and pi over two. Now, you, if it's been a while since you had trig, this might blow your mind, maybe not. So let's go ahead and take some examples. Here's a list of four. We're gonna to convert to Cartesian coordinates and polar coordinates and equations as well, because there are polar equations. So let's first start with the Cartesian coordinates. So here I have polars to Cartesians, which means that this negative four is R and theta is equal to the angle two pi over three. Now this is actually the easiest conversion, converting from polar coordinates to Cartesian coordinates. It's the easiest conversion because it's a straightforward application of the fact that we know x is equal to r cosine of theta and y is equal to r sine of theta. In this case, r is negative 4. And we know the angle is 2 pi over 3. So there's nothing that's going to blow our minds here. And we all have had trig. So we happen to know that the cosine of two pi over three is a negative one half. So this is gonna be two. And we know that the sine of two pi over three is a positive root three over two. So that is going to be a negative two root three. So the uh, Cartesian coordinate for negative four comma two pi over three is just two comma negative two root three. Now let's go ahead and use some technology to take a look at that. Now to do this, we're gonna go ahead and uh, plot the points. First, I'm gonna do uh, the Cartesian uh, point, which is, we said was two comma uh, negative two square root of three. Okay. And let's see if I could see that on here two down two or three. Okay, good. And then we're going to go and graph that in the polar coordinate system. And then the, and maybe I should show the label. Eh, nah. In the polar coordinate system, remember it's R cosine theta comma R sine of theta. And R for that problem was negative four. So negative four cosine of and theta was two pi over three. And we have r, again, negative four, sine of that two pi over three. And if you take a look, let me go ahead and remove all this stuff. If you take a look, actually, they are the same point. Uh, I can turn off uh, the purple point, which is our polar, and turn back on the Cartesian, which is orange, turn it on the polar, there you go. They are the same point. Now let's look at part B here. The harder direction is to convert to polar coordinates. And I kind of chose an easy Cartesian coordinate to move into polar coordinates, but it's so that we can kind of get the idea. Obviously, if you go back one and down one in Cartesian coordinates, your reference angle is pi over four. But I, I just want a nice angle so that we can showcase uh, what I was doing earlier with the absolute values. So let's see here. Uh, I happen to know that x is equal to r cos of theta, oops, except that I have to actually spell cosine correctly, and y is equal to r sine of theta, but that's not going to help me here too much because they didn't give me r, they didn't give me theta. But I also know that r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. And the final formula that I know is going to be that the reference angle theta hat is equal to the tan inverse of the arc tangent of the absolute value of y over x. Okay, again, I highly recommend that you use that formula. 
So anyway, to convert to polar coordinates, we need r and theta. So we were given x and y. That's the square root of negative 1 squared plus negative 1 squared, or in other words, square root of 2. So I happen to have r. And theta hat, the reference angle, is the arctan of the absolute value of y over x. That's just going to be 1. And we happen to know very quickly that what the angle we'd plug into tangent to get out one would be pi over four, at least the angle between in the first quadrant. So my reference angle is pi over four. Again, in calculus, you'll be working pretty much with radians. Okay. So my reference angle is pi over four. Now I just need to use a little bit of, of logic here and note that because X was negative and Y was negative, we are in quadrant three. And as I tell my trig students, uh, uh, trigonometry is all about reference angles and quadrants. We have a reference angle, we have a quadrant, I have a real angle. My real angle is theta equals five pi over four. That's the angle in quadrant three with reference angle uh, pi over four. So therefore my polar coordinate, uh, my polar coordinate for this x Cartesian coordinate, negative 1, negative 1, is going to be, remember, alphabetical order, r theta, root 2, comma, 5 pi over 4. Now let's go ahead and check that using technology. Again, back to Desmos, Cartesian coordinate point would be negative 1, negative 1. That's in black. And then to graph the polar point, uh, remember, it was root two, five pi over four. So remember the uh, X value is always uh, R, which is root two, uh, cosine of theta, which was five pi over four. Oops, I don't need that. And uh, the Y value is R sine of theta. So square root of two, and then sine of five pi over four. Again, turning off the polar, you can see where the black point is, that is the Cartesian, and the red point is the polar. They are exactly the same point. Now for some fun. Let's start converting equations. So that equation in part C there, that's the one we're looking at, is a really gnarly looking equation, one that would be very difficult for us to graph by hand. And in fact, in polars, it might be fairly difficult as well. What we're going to do is convert everything that says x into r cosine of theta and everything that says y into r sine of theta. Okay, so let's go ahead and just make those substitutions. So we have 2 times r cosine of theta uh, minus 5 times r cubed cosine cubed of theta is equal to 1 plus, that's r cos times r sine, or in other words, r squared cos theta sine theta. Now, honestly, if you if you could do it, um, it would be nice to solve this just for r. If you can explicitly solve for r, that'd be awesome, because that's generally how uh, polar equations are written, as explicit functions of r, like, for example, d is, right? d is an explicit function r of theta. Unfortunately, in this example, the equation is so complex that it cannot be written um, easily as r equals, uh, unless it, uh, well, it can't be written explicitly easily, um, if at all, okay? So this is kind of where I would stop with this one, um, but not always, right? So it's not always going to be the case that you would stop right here. It's just that this one specifically, there's just nothing you could do. You're kind of stuck. But let's actually see what these look like in with using technology. So graphing out implicits in Desmos is pretty easy. Just 2x minus 5x cubed. Obviously, I am graphing the um, implicits implicitly defined Cartesian coordinate equation equals one plus X, Y. You can see right here, let me zoom out a little bit. That's a pretty ugly looking curve, right? Um, well, it's still somewhat beautiful. If you zoom out far enough, it just looks like a line. But anyhow, uh, so let's go ahead and I'm gonna turn that off and I'll graph our polar. Our polar was two R, I'm, I'm not sure by the way if, um, 
Desmos will actually graph uh, implicit, implicitly defined polar curves. We're about to find out, you and I together. So minus five r cubed uh, cosine uh, cubed of theta. There is something um, that uh, Desmos has an issue with equals one. Yeah. So let me, let me do this. Sometimes Desmos has an issue with the cubing function of the cosine. So, um, I noticed that the other day, nope, it's still not going to graph this. So even if I put R squared and if I put the cosine of theta and the sine of theta, right? Yeah. Nope. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, the way we have um, this, and because it's implicitly defined in terms of polars, it cannot be done. So unfortunately, that's just what we're stuck with. As our final conversion example, we're just going to convert a polar equation, r equals negative 8 cosecant of theta, into a Cartesian coordinate, or Cartesian equation, not Cartesian coordinate. Well, r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. Just the hypotenuse. You can kind of think of it th that way. And this is negative eight over the sine of theta. Well, I jumped the gun there, didn't I? Um, by starting with uh, that, I, I really, I shouldn't have started with that. I actually should have, because I want to place an R down here. I don't know what sine of theta is, but I know what R sine of theta is. So I'd love that to have an R there. What I'm going to do is multiply both sides by the sign and uh, and then uh, restart the problem. If you multiply both sides by the sign, you'll get R sine of theta is equal to a negative eight. Of course, you do have to tell the world um, that there was an issue right at the beginning. The issue is that sine of theta cannot be zero because you would have been dividing by zero right? So in other words, theta cannot be a multiple of pi. So your angle can't be a multiple of pi. Well, let's see what this ends up being. Y is equal to negative eight, right? R sine of theta is Y. So this is a fancy way of saying I have a horizontal line, Y equals negative eight. The angle that you're facing cannot be an integer multiple of pi. Well, think about integer multiples of pi. That means theta can't be zero. In other words, you can't be facing the polar axis. Well, there's no way that I can graph the line y equals negative eight. Let me just throw that curve down just really quickly. Here's y equals negative eight right here, right? There's no way that I can graph that line if I'm facing the polar axis. And the same thing, I can't face pi. Well, this is pi right here. There's no way I can get down to, I can't step forward 10 steps and get down to that line. So it makes sense that my angle cannot be um, uh, a integer multiple of pi. Let's go ahead and double check this using technology. All right, so we originally had r equals negative eight cosecant of theta and you can't see it here but there it is right there and that is actually y equals negative eight so there you go they are the same now we're going to start doing some graphs because that's actually the sweet spot of polar coordinate system is is the graphing part and this is generally the part that a lot of students hate because they can't they, it's just a totally new graphing system to them so it's a little bit tough so what we're going to do here is we'll start with A. We're going to graph these by hand, okay? And A, I actually can't, um, I'm sure that I could probably figure it out uh, using technology, and I'll give it a try after we're done here. But uh, for now, um, let's just see what this looks like by hand. So let's see. I want to graph the interval R between 3 and 4. Notice that I don't have any condition on theta. Well, actually, I technically do. I have r that has to be between three and four and theta that has to be between three pi over two and five pi over two. Well, that's kind of interesting. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'm gonna go ahead and plop down a, oh, I have to get my pen all set up, sorry about that. Plop down a graph here. Now, first of all, I'm gonna point out where three pi over two is. Uh, so, and I need a thicker uh, pen for that just something that kind of showcases it. So this is the direction of three pi over two and the direction of five pi over two is up here. 
Okay. Now, I want to plot points between that angle of 3 pi over 2 and 5 pi over 2, including the angle 3 pi over 2 and including the angle 5 pi over 2. So my whatever I'm going to plot is somewhere in this region. First quadrant and fourth quadrant, if you want to talk about it that way. And the radius of how far I'm going to step away from the pole here is going to be between 3 and 4. Basically, this is saying I want any point between three and four units away from the pole, but in quadrants one and four. So if I go ahead and say this is one, two, three units away, one, two, three units away, and one, two, three units away, that's probably not terribly accurate, but whatever. So those are my three units away. And here is my fourth unit away. So these are all, what I'm showing you is a region where I'm stepping away from the pole between three and four units away from it. I want every R value, every point between three and four units away. And so I'm going to shade those. Those are just these points right here. Okay, so this is actually a kind of an interesting graph because it's not something you would normally see in maybe a pre-calculus course, but there you have it. We have a shaded region, and this is kind of apropos for us in Calc 2, Integral Calculus, because we'll often want to find the areas of regions between curve, polar curves. In part B of this example, we have a more traditional approach. And by the way, I my uh, in part A, I just sketched it in the polar coordinate system without converting because um, I just ran right into it. But it does say sketch each polar curve manually by first graphing the related equation in the Cartesian coordinate system. That will be somewhat challenging with this next example, right? Because R here is the square root of X squared plus Y squared. And this four sine, um, that is four times the sine of theta. I mean, what can I say about that, right? So I need to multiply both sides by R to go ahead and get this into where my coefficient of sine is R. So I'm going to multiply both sides by R and I get R squared is equal to four R sine of theta. And when I do that, now I can see, well, R squared is X squared plus Y squared. And that's equal to four times R sine, which is Y. Now I'm going to go ahead and do some completing the square, right? X squared plus Y squared minus 4Y is equal to 0. What I'm going to do is add half of this guy squared to both sides. That's completing the square, right? And so that implies I'm actually looking at the equation X squared plus Y minus 2 squared is equal to 4. Well, that's a circle of radius 2 shifted up 2 units. So if I were to graph that in the Cartesian coordinate system, and therefore in a polar, it is going to look like, well, I'll put the center right here. It's a circle of radius 2. Forgive my poorly drawn circle, but there we have it. That is actually the polar curve. So notice that in the Cartesian coordinate system, it's kind of a, I wouldn't say an ugly equation, it's a somewhat beautiful equation, but it's definitely much simpler in the polar coordinate system. And so let's look for, let's go ahead and first of all, make certain that we are correct with this graph. And then we're gonna look for patterns. I'm gonna actually showcase kind of what you should look for uh, to recognize um, what these shapes are. So whenever, whenever you see an R, equals a sine of theta or r equals a cosine of theta what should that look like so the question is what does r equals a cosine or sine of theta look like i'm going to put in a sine of theta because i usually start with that oops sine of theta all right and we're going to add a slider to a here and i'm going to have a start at zero and go to five okay and that's it. All right, so from 0 to 5. If you take a look at this, 
it is a circle. Let me go ahead and increase this and blow this up. It's a circle of radius, whatever A is, or actually, I'm sorry, diameter. If you look at that, if A is roughly near four, the diameter of the circle is near to four. And by the way, if A is, or if, if the trig function is sine, then it is opening along the y-axis, or our traditional y-axis. Okay, so the diameter is A, and it's opening along the traditional y-axis. If, by the way, A were allowed to be negative, let me go and maybe zoom out a little bit so we can see this. Again, I can go from five all the way down to negative five. Now notice it's still opening along the vertical axis there. Let me zoom out a little bit more. So if you open along the vertical axis for sine, then it should tell you you're going to be opening along the horizontal axis if it's a cosine. Okay, and the negative or the positive value of the coefficient just tells you if it's a negative or the positive um, axis, right? The upper or the lower or the right or the left. So let's insert cosine here just so we can convince ourselves and then see it go through along the cosine axis, which is the x-axis, okay? So there you go. And here's the theorem. Sorry, I was missing an N there. Here's the theorem uh, for what we've just kind of discovered, right? So R of theta is equal to A sine of theta or R of theta is equal to A cosine of theta. Those aren't arc cosines or arc sines. It's just A constant times sine and constant times cosine is a circle, diameter A, right? And so uh, as we saw actually in our last example, we have r equals four sine of theta, and that ended up be, being a circle of radius two, but diameter four. And that is why this theorem says it's a circle of diameter a and radius a over two along the relevant axis, right? Axis. So sine is along the pause, it's along the y axis and cosine is along the x axis, like we mentioned earlier. And obviously if the coefficient's negative, it's only a negative part of that. So let's go ahead and graph a few others. Um, some using concepts or um, just our our intuition and others possibly converting to uh, the um, Cartesian coordinate system. So theta equals three pi over four. Let's go right here, part C. If you have theta equals three pi over four, that means R could be anything. Well, that's kind of interesting. Um, how would you graph that? Well, let me go ahead and throw this down. So remember, I'm facing from the pole here. I'm facing, in fact, you know what I should probably do from this point forward? I should just draw the polar axis. There we have it. So there we have it. Ah, except I erased it for some weird reason. So let me go ahead and go back and put that in there. Great. All right. So I'm going to stand at the pole here, and then I'm going to turn through an angle of 3 pi over 4. Right? That's in quadrant 2. And now I'm facing 3 pi over 4, and what this tells me is I don't care how far you step out. You can step out five units, two units, negative three units, whatever you want. So this basically says I can be anywhere along this line. So theta equals three pi over four is the equation of a line going through the pole. And that's actually very quick and easy. Now let's suppose that we're going to not suppose. Let's just go ahead and do D. I don't know why I said let's suppose we're going to do D. We're going to do D here. So... Uh, let's see, I have r cos of theta is equal to 4. Well, I happen to know that r cosine of theta is just a stand-in for x. So this is x equals 4. So in the Cartesian coordinate system, it would be a vertical line. And by the way, that's the same thing that it will be in the polar coordinate system. It's a vertical line at x equals 4. So let me go ahead and graph that maybe in a different color, though. So I'll go over 1, 2, 3, four units. There we have it. So r cosine of theta equals four is just this vertical line. Let's go ahead and see that uh, using uh, Desmos. So we had r times the cosine of theta so let me, is equal to four. 
you see that purple vertical line? That is actually the same thing as x equals four. You can see it right in there. Turn off x equals four, turn it back on. Yep, that works. Now let's take a look at part E. And in fact, I'm gonna modify part E because that's not gonna be instructive the way it is written. I'm gonna write this R equals cosine of two theta, just because it's not instructive the way I've written it that way. It's, it's a little bit of a mess actually. So R equals cosine of two theta. Now, in this case, I can't just multiply both sides by R. If I tried to do that, I'd get R squared is equal to R cosine of two theta. And while R squared can be X squared plus Y squared, R times the cosine of two theta is not X. So unfortunately I'm stuck. So what I can do here is build a table of values to help me out. So I'll have angles on one side and R's on the other, where R is just cosine of, Two theta, I'll write that in there. And remember the two from your trig class, that the argument of two inside the cosine that is attached to the theta tells us that this cosine is going twice as fast. And so what I'm gonna do is take finer steps. I'm not gonna go zero and pi over two and things like that. I'm gonna like zero, maybe I'll go pi over eight and then pi over uh, four, and then I'll try a pi, three pi over eight. And maybe, uh, let's, I'm stepping by pi over eight. So four pi over eight or pi over two and so on and so forth. Okay. So maybe that's how I'm going to build it out. And in fact, you check my work here, but when you plug in zero, cosine of zero is one, you plug in pi over eight, cosine of pi over four is one over root two. You plug in pi over four, cosine of pi over two is zero. Plug in three pi over eight, which ends up being three pi over four, which is a negative one over root two. And uh, plug in a pi over two, it's cosine of pi, it's a negative one. And let's go ahead and, and continue actually, because this will be instructive here. So I'm gonna keep stepping by pi over eight. So that's four pi over eight. Now we're at five pi over eight. And then we'll go to six pi over eight, which is three pi over two. And we'll go seven pi over eight. And we'll go to eight pi over eight, which is pi. Oops, I messed up right there. It's three pi over four. All right, so if I plug that in five pi over eight, that's the same thing as five pi over four when it's multiplied by two and cosine of five pi over four is a negative one over root two. Three pi over four when you plug in is cosine of three pi over two, which is zero. And then cosine of seven pi over eight, but when you plug in it's seven pi over four, that's actually a positive one over root two. And then finally, cosine of two pi is one. All right, so let's go ahead and graph these and I'm gonna um, put my polar axis just to the right. Oops, I thought I was uh, putting a point on the board there, here we are. Okay, so here's our polar axis and our pole. And let's see, when uh, we're facing an angle of zero, we step out one unit. And then when we're facing an angle of pi over eight, which is 20, roughly, not roughly, it's 22.5 degrees, we're uh, only out one over root two, which is about 0.4. When I'm facing an angle of 45 degrees or pi over four, the radius or the distance away it's zero, so I'm back at the pole. So visually what's happened is it's done something like this. It's followed this pattern, right? I, when I teach it in a pre-calculus class, I tell my students that initially you have a fishing line. When you're facing an angle of zero, you have a fishing line that's out one foot in front of you. And as you start turning, you're reeling it in. Once you're 22.5 degrees, it's reeled in a little bit. And then once you're facing 45 degrees, it's all the way at your feet. And then you keep turning. Now you're just a little bit beyond 45 degrees, okay? But now that you're facing this direction, you're throwing the, the reel, the, the line, you're throwing it directly behind you. So let's go ahead and just go behind us by 0.4 units. And then when you're facing pi over two, which is this way, it is behind you one full unit, way back here. So this is the how you kind of kept throwing your line behind you when you're throwing this reel out, 
Okay. And now you're facing, let's see, 5 pi over 8, which is roughly this direction, right? And when you're facing that 5 pi over 8, again, you're still throwing it kind of behind you. About, oops, it's behind you because of the negative value. About that far behind you. So you must have done this. You must have started kind of reeling it back in. And then by the time you're facing 3 pi over 4, which is this direction right here, it is right back at your feet. Okay. And if you continue this process, um, so now we're going to start facing 7 pi over 8, which is roughly this direction, is now... Uh, well, actually, technically, it's probably right about there, honestly. It's about 1 over root 2 in front of you. And then when you're facing pi, which is this direction, it's one full foot in front of you or one full distance in front of you. So you're following this arc. Notice I'm putting the arrows in like it's a parametric curve, because it is. And this pattern will continue. You can keep doing this. You'll see that it'll flow like this. Okay. Okay. And it'll start carving out here and finish out there. We'll go ahead and use technology to verify this. But this is actually true. This is a four-leaf rose. And notice the angle, cosine of 2 theta. And it resulted in a four-leaf rose. So it ends up, if you have an even number in there, then it'll end up with a double that size rose. Or double that petal rose. Using a little bit of technology, r equals uh, cosine of 2 theta. You can see it right in there, right? Let me zoom in because it's a much better picture than I could do by hand. Um, and I had mentioned that if this is even, it just doubles the number. So let's make that a 4, and you can see there it is again. There's actually 8 petals there. Same thing would be true, by the way, if it was a sign. It's just slightly off kilter. So everything shifted slightly, and that's because initially, if you think about it, when you're facing an angle of zero, uh, sine of zero is zero. So you're not all the way out here at one. Um, and so it causes a slight tilt to it, but you still have eight pedals. And so now you can start playing with this. But one thing that you should note is if it's even it's double the number of pedals, if it's odd, it's just that many pedals. And so you can go ahead and experiment with this if you want. Go to um, to Desmos and play around. And you can see how this gets carved out. Let me get something a little more interesting here. 7, cosine of 7 theta. And the way you're going to do that normally is you would say, okay, well, to plot a point on Desmos, it has to be in Cartesian. So normally you would say r cosine of theta, sine, r sine of theta, right? Because that's uh, the x and the y value. However, r is being played by cosine of 7 theta. And that r as well, cosine of 7 theta. But this is not going to plot anything. I got to put in, instead of theta, a parameter a. So here I go. I'm putting in a parameter a. And now I'll add a slider. And the slider, I'm going to start at 0. And I'm going to go to, because this I have going seven times as quickly. So it should go through the full cycle and pi, 2 pi over 7 units. And let me go ahead. I'll hit play, but I'm going to slow it down quite a bit. Oh, maybe not that slow. All right. And let me start here. Okay. So here we go. It's carving it out. Let me speed it up a little bit. And you can see the path of the particle. Let me speed it up even further uh, so you can kind of see what happens, right? Oh, geez. Sorry about that. I only went to 2 pi over 7 and that didn't go all the way. Let's go to 2 pi. Sorry. I I should have. Whoops, but I'm still going somewhat quickly, aren't I? There you go, right? So very cool. It's a very cool way to kind of see how this gets carved out. Yeah, very, very neat. Anyhow, you can play with that. And this is just what we've been saying, but in theorem form, right? So we have a rose if um, r is equal to a sine of b theta or r is equal to a cosine of b theta, uh, it is a rose. It has n petals if n is odd. So like we said in 
twice that many if n is even. Now I am actually going to skip f here and we're just going to jump right into uh, G and the uh, and the instruction there is to use technology. Obviously that one, maybe it's not so obvious to you, but it's fairly obvious to me that that one has to be done using technology. And by the way, this should be a theta and that should be a theta. Okay, so uh, I don't know why I had it as T's, but those should be thetas. So let's go ahead and see this in uh, in using technology. Okay, uh, and it, here when we do this, we're gonna have a couple things I'm gonna teach you. One is uh, to be able to restrict the domain of a function in Desmos. So we were given R is equal to E raised to the sine of theta. Hopefully Desmos can handle this computational, uh, uh, this, this type of computation. Minus uh, two cosine of uh, four theta, sorry, I'm reading this off of a piece of paper. Woo, that's pretty neat looking so far. Uh, plus, um, I'm going to put the following, I'm just going to write sine of uh, theta. I know it was sine to the fifth, okay? So somebody's going to say, but it was sine to the fifth. It's sine to the fifth, but it was, um, it, for some reason, every once in a while, Desmos does not like uh, to write the fifth power, uh, or I shouldn't say the fifth power, I should say, oh, it doesn't like to write powers. I'll put the five there. I think that is the fifth power. It doesn't like to write powers um, uh, right next to sign sometimes. I don't know why. Okay, and we're going to restrict, restrict this. So, so far you see some rad looking curve, right? But now we're going to restrict the domain. How do you restrict the domain? You put in pipes, these types of braces, and I'm gonna say that zero is uh, less than theta, which is less than 24 pi. It didn't really do very much, but let's go ahead and, and minimize this and zoom out. Oh, man, come on. Who doesn't like a butterfly? Oh, that sounds weird. Anyway, uh, pretty cool, right? So, uh, power of polars. Okay, you should really be able to do a problem like this, but I'm, I snuck it in here because um, you're commonly going to be uh, trying to find uh, times where your your polar uh, curve goes through certain points or goes to the pole or something like that. So it's it's incredibly important for you to be able to do this. Um, and so obviously going through the pole means that R is equal to zero. So you're going to be solving this equation, right? And so we know that uh, cosine becomes zero when its angle, its reference angle, or its angles, I should say, are just um, integer, integer multiples of, or odd multiples of pi over two, odd multiple being two, two K plus one, right? So that's an odd number, by the way, where K is an element of the integers. There we go. So pi over two and three pi over two and so on and so forth. And Often people will not leave it like this, honestly. So um, I don't know why I have a four theta hat. It's just four theta, honestly. Uh, so there we go. Four theta is equal to uh, pi k plus uh, pi over two. Uh, and then you divide everything by four. So this happens when theta is equal to, I'm going to rewrite it as pi over eight plus pi over four. Okay. It's just kind of important that you're able to do that. Um, again, because you're going to find times, you're going to need to find times when your um, polar curve crosses certain things. So this is a reminder that you're going to have to review your trig. Now, probably the most important types of curves are these groups right here. And unfortunately, I just don't have all the time in the world to finish out a video on this. Um, but you have cardioids, limousons with inner loops and limousons without inner loops. Um, and often I do not have these memorized or anything like that. I just have a way of knowing kind of the, how to work this out without memorizing a bunch of theorems. So let me just, first of all, let's take a moment and we'll go ahead and use technology to showcase these theorems. But then we're going to come back here and then I'm going to talk about what would happen if somebody handed you um, just some uh, polar 
equation and asked you to graph it and you couldn't remember um, these names, you couldn't remember uh, the, the formulas or something like that, how could you derive the curves very quickly? So let's go ahead and start with technology. Actually, this is a pretty easy to showcase. A, I'm gonna say plus B sine of theta. And then we're gonna put sliders on A and B. So we're gonna let A go from negative uh, 10. No, let's not do negative 10, 10. We'll just do ne negative five to five. And B will go negative five to five as well. All right. So right now, B and A are the same. And this is what you get. Let me zoom in here. Okay. Now, suppose that you allow B to be slightly larger. Then you get this inner loop. Uh, and we'll discuss how to, when, when graphing, how that looks. And if B is slightly less, right? So B is less than A, you get that, uh, that it's kind of heart shaped, but unfortunately, it's just um, doesn't have enough to get that inner loop. And by the way, uh, if B goes negative, all of a sudden, once B starts going negative, see right there, that means the coefficient of the sine is negative. That means the sine starts weighting itself towards the lower y-axis. So if sine is positive, it's the upper y-axis. If it's negative, it's the lower y-axis. Let me get this kind of situated a little bit better. And again, if B ends up in magnitude being greater than A, there's an inner loop there and it just gets larger. And of course, now um, I don't really need to play with A because you can see it's just going to kind of get the same thing. Of course, uh, there is kind of a weird thing that happens if A is very, very negative. It almost becomes circular. Uh, it's not. It's a limousine, but it becomes somewhat circular there. And you can test this out with cosine but it's going to be the same way, right? So if B ends up being greater than A, you get an inner loop. If it's less than A, uh, you get this kind of bump. Uh, if B is negative, it's centered, uh, or I'm sorry, not centered, but weighted towards the negative uh, X axis. So you can play with this all day long, right? It's a very fast and easy thing to fiddle around with, to find what works for you to understand it. All right, so how do you graph these without having to memorize all that stuff, right? They're basically all cardioids, honestly. Um, just some don't make it all the way back to the pole, and um, some have inner loops and some don't, okay? So it kind of all revolves around what is the trig function, and is it positive or negative? We'll start there. The fact that it's a negative sine curve tells me that the major axis is the y-axis and it the major part of these this limousine or the cardioid is going to be on the lower part of the y-axis if that was a plus sign it'd be the upper part of the y-axis so i happen to know immediately that if i were to draw and let me go ahead and just start with a pole here or a polar axis if i were to draw this curve i know that it would start way down here it wouldn't start technically but it would the major beef of it would be down there. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, well, what is the worst case scenario? How big will this get? Well, think about the sign. The sign ranges from negative one to one, right? So oh, maybe I should have wrote to, or pulled this down. The sign goes between negative one and one. So that's Oops, it's supposed to be a positive one there. So that whatever that is, is going to be between negative one and one. In other words, it's going to be either a negative three or a positive three in worst case scenarios. So if it's a positive three, that'd be five, right? So this whole picture in worst case scenario, well, I say worst case, edge case, it's going to be five. The other edge case is if that remains a negative three there. So two minus three is a negative one. Well, lo and behold, if you uh, take a look at the Y values here, uh, let's go ahead and note that at some point, two minus three sine theta, at some point that will be zero. So this two minus three sine of theta can become zero 
because sine is going to let that three range from, again, a negative three to a positive three. So at some point, it'll be a two, right? So I happen to know at some point, it's going to cross this pole. That tells me immediately that, remember, I said it's it's like a, a there'll be a point where it's a negative one. That tells me immediately this has an inner loop. So let's go ahead and just start some facing values. When theta is equal to zero, so I'm facing the polar axis. When theta is equal to zero, I'm two units out. Let's just pretend as though this is one, this is two units out. When theta is equal to pi over two, sine of pi over two, well, sine of pi over two is one. So that's two minus three or negative one. So when I'm facing this direction, it is backward one unit. Now when I'm facing pi, sine of pi is going to be zero. So you're when you're facing that direction, you're out two units. So let me just go ahead and say one, two units. And then finally, when you're facing, not finally technically, but it is kind of finally to me, when you're facing three pi over two, sine of three pi over two is negative one. And so you're two minus three times a negative one or two plus three, um, which is five. So that, like I said, this is gonna be five units away. Those are all my key points. Now watch how I graph this. I know that it's going to look like this. It might bow out, by the way, because it's a nice smooth curve. Okay. It's going to want to come in. It's going to loop inside. And because I'm freehanding, it's not the best in the world, but it, it'll get the job done. It looks like that. Okay, notice the heaviest, bulkiest part of this is along the negative y-axis. And again, I just kind of built a table really quickly in my head. So again, let's pretend as though you have r is equal to a negative 4 plus uh, 1 cosine of theta. That's a silly thing. I, I should say plus, let's say, 3 because the 1 looks weird. Okay, again, I'm just going to quickly build out a table of values for zero pi over two pi and three pi over two cosine of zero is one so negative four plus three is going to be a negative one uh, cosine of pi over two is zero so you just have a negative four cosine of pi is negative one so you have a negative seven and cosine of three pi over two is uh, zero and so you're back at negative four now, I happen to know, again, this is a cosine curve. So it's positive cosine. So the bulk of this should possibly be on the, in the positive x direction. Let's just go ahead and plot those points. So face an angle of zero and go backwards one unit. Face an angle of pi over four, or pi over two, sorry, and go back four units. One, two, three, four units. Face an angle of pi, it's this way <laughs> okay and go back seven units one two three four five six off the screen at seven and finally face an angle three pi over two that's this way and go backwards four units one two three four units notice you didn't cross the uh you didn't go through the pole and that should make sense because you're negative four, and the worst case scenario for this cosine is gonna be positive or negative three. There's no way it's gonna be zero. So you're never gonna go back to your feet when you're drawing this out if you're standing at the pole. So this is gonna look, it's a limousole here, or cardioid if you wanna call it that. But it's actually technically a limousole. It's gonna come down, it'll actually kinda of bow in, to be honest with you, uh, and then come back out. They all kind of look like hearts in a way. They have that little bow in right there. Okay. So again, I didn't memorize the shape. I just plotted out some points and graphed it out. Now, when you reach, now in Calc 2, what you're going to do is you're going to have this and you're going to have an intersection of this with possibly another shape. And you're going to find the area between these curves and stuff like that. That's what you're going to do in your calculus class. We should probably double check using technology that we're right for both of these. So again, we'll look at uh, this guy, two minus three sine of theta, and we'll look at this guy, negative four plus three cosine of theta.
So we can see that our first graph was right. It wasn't perfect, but it was right. And our second graph, let's go right here, was also correct. Again, not perfect, but actually pretty close. Finally, in a pre-calculus course, you normally deal with symmetry of polar curves as well. And so you can use like symmetry about the polar axis or symmetry about the vertical axis or symmetry about the pole itself. Um, and that can be used. It does sometimes get used in calculus, but often it, it doesn't. So um, I'm just going to state the theorems. I'm not going to do any examples here, but the theorems go as follows. If you can plug in the, uh, the argument, the negative of the argument or the opposite of the argument, so negative theta, and it ends up being the same thing as r of theta, then it is uh, symmetric about the traditional x-axis or the polar axis. So it's symmetric about the x-axis, the horizontal axis. If, on the other hand, you can plug in a negative r and it's the same thing as having the regular r, or if r of theta is the same thing as having r of theta plus pi, that means that you can rotate by an angle of pi and the picture looks the same. Well, if you can rotate by 180 degrees and the picture's still the same, that is symmetric about the origin or in the Cartesian coordinate system, or in other words here, symmetric about the pole. And finally, if you can say that R of theta is the same thing as R of pi minus theta, that means that you, you are reflecting about the vertical axis. Um, and so anyway, you could check your textbook for examples for that, but I'm not going to actually do that here, uh, mainly for time, um, because I have to wrap this up. So I hope that these, this video helped you. Um, I didn't do a ton of examples because that's really for a pre-calculus, but you should be able to, um, uh, open up your text and uh, review any extra details if you need to.